Today we're here to talk about uh, self-sovereign sexuality, um, sort of our, our, some personal stories from our, our journey and what we've learned from them uh, and how, uh, you know, how we've come to some of the conclusions that we've come to uh, and how uh, we think that uh, the Ethereum community and the sex worker community are more aligned than most people think. Uh, so I wanna, I wanna start out with just um, a s sort of high level thing uh, about rationality itself. Uh, so rationality is about having mental models that are calibrated with reality. Uh, so it's about asking yourself, uh, why do I believe what I believe? Uh, and then not believing the things that you don't think are true, uh, even if you want to. <clears throat> uh, so when, when we started Spank Chain, uh, most people thought it was a really bad idea uh, and even a joke. And this was like about a year ago uh, in the heyday of like sort of virtue signaling, ICO, everybody shaking each other's hand and, you know, uh, <clears throat> and I thought it was basically all bullshit. Uh, and, and I thought like, you know, where, where is blockchain adoption going to happen first? Like where, where does this actually matter? Like who gives a shit about this? Uh, and that's what drove me to realize that, you know, the, the adult entertainment community, this community that's been routinely discriminated against, ostracized, uh, f from the financial institutions, like this is where it starts, right? Because this is this is the people who, uh, you know, having a safe place to securely store and transact their funds is actually really important. Uh, and so I think now, you know, a year later, uh, we we had a lot to prove, but I think we've done a pretty good job, and it's become somewhat accepted that we're decent devs, uh, and that we're trying to do good in the world. Uh, and I hope. Uh, that as the going gets weirder, uh, the community doesn't write us off <coughs> uh, as crazies uh, and takes a moment to reflect on our logic uh, and draw sensible conclusions. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm gonna start with uh, a story uh, about a uh, personal experience. <clears throat> about, about a year ago, uh, I was feeling pretty depressed, uh, ego depleted, uh, pretty low self-esteem. Um, I, I didn't spend a, a lot of time on Tinder because it, it took, you know, it was, I was working a lot and it takes a long time. Uh, and, and when I tried to hang out with girls, I kept like fumbling it up somehow. Uh, and I was lonely and it was affecting my productivity. Uh, and Ethan had been going up a lot. Uh, so I had uh, more disposable income than I was used to. Uh, so I spent a few nights checking out the escorts in my area before I finally worked up the courage to text one. And it was a lot of like, you know, me sitting there looking at it and being like, I'm not the type of guy who does this. Uh, and, and then the rational part of me is like, how do you know, right? <laughs> like, uh, yeah, why not? Like, how do you know you wouldn't enjoy it? It's like, all right, well, <sighs> you have a point. Uh, so I talked to an escort, set up an appointment, and about an hour before I went to go get cash, and I realized that I hit my daily limit in the ATM uh, withdrawal. Uh, and so I, I, I freaked out. I, I started texting all my friends uh, to see if anybody could come deliver me cash. Uh, <laughs> and nobody could. I went to a bunch of other ATMs uh, and, and eventually I had to give up uh, and tell the escort that like, hey, sorry, I know I made a two hour appointment, but can we, can we only do one hour? <laughs> um, and, and that I would make it up to her. But when she got there and after we'd established a rapport, uh, I, I introduced her to the world of crypto. Uh, and helped her get set up on an exchange uh, and sent her her first ethers. <coughs> uh, and, and, and she ended up staying the extra hour. <coughs> uh, and so, yeah, um, that, that was like my first experience. And, and since then, I've, I've sort of come around to this idea that like, you know, some, one of the slides I really liked in the last presentation was uh, morality is not equal to legality. <coughs> uh, I think we should all keep that in mind. <laughs> all right, without further ado. Da -da -da. Cool. All right. Chelsea, take it away. So I guess I'll give a little intro uh, on myself because I'm pretty new to Spank Chain. Um, I was a sex worker for a number of years before I found crypto. I really wish I had known about crypto when I was a sex worker. It would have been super, super useful. But the three or so years that I've been a Bitcoin educator, 
I have approached crypto as a technology with the knowledge of the things I went through and the ways that with some weird gray areas, I got exploited with implications. So I've been coming to this tech for a while with the idea that it could really help people not go through shit I went through. Um, and I was like a lurking fan of Spank Chain and really seeing how they were playing in this space of expanding the Overton window of what it's acceptable to talk about. They were showing that crypto people, sex workers, and other people kind of on the fringe of things have a huge amount in common. So, uh, so yeah, basically, I mean, I was, like, I was like lurking in their Discord for a year as a Bitcoin maximalist liking their crypto economics. So like that says something. Like I was like, holy shit, this is brilliant on a technical level. So uh, yeah, we're just gonna go through, this kind of summarizes the slides to follow. So we're just gonna go through some of the shared concerns of crypto people and sex workers. So uh, trust but verify, which I found out is a Ronald Reagan original, very, very clever of the man. Um, so we see in crypto, you know, full nodes. We, we depend upon people running full nodes. We depend upon the idea that this decentralized technology can be spun up from scratch by anyone and that you can verify all your own transactions. Similarly, sex workers, especially face-to-face -face sex workers, have to verify who they're meeting. And in fact, that's one of the biggest attack vectors is uh, one of the worst experiences I had was I had blocked someone and he went through the agency I was working with under a completely different name. And then I opened the door of a penthouse and was like, oh my God, it's that guy. So technologies that allow allow us to create layers of protection for ourselves, pseudonymous layers ideally, are really important to both of us. But in both cases, we're putting some trust in these systems that we're opting into. We're putting some trust into the larger cryptocurrency framework. We're putting trust into the sex worker client relationship and that goes in both directions. Yeah, one of the other fun things about this is uh, the cold start problem uh, for full nodes. Like, who here has tried to sync uh, parody or geth, uh, and like who here felt pain? <laughs> yeah. So uh, a lot of times, you know, escorts will require uh, a, a, a verification from another one. So if you've never done it before, uh, you, you end up having to share like your LinkedIn or like your work email or something. And it's it's a whole thing. Anyway. Similarly, and I mean, title of the talk here: self sovereignty is core to both of these communities. Crypto. We don't want anybody to get in the way of how we transact between, between ourselves. And sex work, we don't want anyone to get in the way of how we use our bodies. In general, these are two of the cutting edge areas in which we're starting to see that we actually can uh, create, uh, we can create off ramps from legacy systems that have restricted us and told us that whatever the dominant morality of the time is in fact the legality. Uh, privacy. This is see. This is this is an interesting one because within crypto, you know, when I first got into Bitcoin, I thought it was relatively anonymous. I did not understand how easily traceable all the shit I was doing were. And so we we've seen like a lot of great presentations from like the Zcash community here and stuff. Like zk snarks being integrated with Ethereum. We've got these tools. Um, I think that in sex work, it becomes more complex because reputation is much more important within sex work and networks of you know, being able to verify that someone's going to deliver on something, that they're going to uh, be who they say they are. Now, it's funny because originally when, when we were discussing this presentation, Amin was pointing out like sex workers using privacy enhancing technologies, proton mail, stuff like that. I was really bad at that. And when I got into crypto, I was really bad at being a responsible crypto user too. So this is actually somewhere where I think creating user-facing tools for sex workers that are comprehensible and easy to understand will be a win. Because like when I, I started out as a stripper and I would have like a beer and then start accidentally using my real name. Because I'm just not used to pretending. Like I'm like, I'm, I'm Chelsea. I mean, made up name, damn it. So it is something that's super important for sex work, and it's something that literally can endanger your life if you're not good at it. Yeah, se sex workers are like straight up cypherpunks. Like they've got <laughs> proton mail accounts, multiple identities, used to dealing with large quantities of cash. You know. 
And uh, the, the ever familiar wrench problem, the XKCD representation of this is the best I know of. Um, so it's been brought up in crypto that we create these complex systems. Oh, I don't have my ledger on me and I don't have, you know, like you can't force my private keys out of me. Well, you can hit me over the head with a wrench until I give you my you know, digital assets. Um, and the oldest profession in the book has this as the oldest problem in the book for it. Like, that is really, and it's usually implications, like not direct extortion, not direct threats of violence, but the implication of violence is something that's constantly th a threat when what you're providing as a service is literally contained upon your person. Like, you're providing a service that when you get right down to it, someone who's sociopathic and be like, oh, I could just take this right now. This is a vulnerable moment for you. So I do feel this is an area where in both directions, crypto and sex work can really enhance our understandings of how to move past this. Uh, so <clears throat> to continue on the safety concerns, uh, in, in crypto, we're always you know, thinking, you, know, you lose your private key, then you lose your coins, right? Uh, and in, in sex work and you know, in general, uh, STD prevention is a huge deal. Uh, if you get AIDS, it's game over, right? Uh, it's, it's very serious. Uh, and so in both, I, I hope that we're able to develop infrastructure for a safer world. Uh, personally, I don't intend to live in a world where STDs are a thing. Uh, I recently found out that you can get $100 at home 15 minute result STD kits mailed to you, and it takes like two weeks to come from Singapore. Uh, so I think that we're, we're and I, I actually did that, and then I streamed myself doing it live, which would have been really awkward if I tested positive for anything. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was lucky enough. I, I actually, I skipped two of the tests. Uh, so I did the syphilis, hep B, hep C, HIV, herpes, but the gonorrhea and chlamydia uh, are urethral swabs. Uh, so I didn't stream that live. Uh, but I, I, I might, if, for science. Right? Yeah, I mean, we, we can't let our... Um, you know, prudish nature get in the way of, of safety, <coughs> right? So, uh, I'll, yeah, we'll do that. Uh, the other tests were blood tests, so I pricked all five of my fingers because they're all separate blood tests. This could get much better in the next couple of years, uh, and if it costs like $100 for a single unit uh, that I get shipped, it could cost like $20 if I bought like 10000 uh, And then you could imagine that uh, somebody, you know, comes to your house that's uh, registered to administer this test. They come at 12.30, you set up an appointment on an app, and then they leave by 1 p.m. and you know your results, right? $50, something like that. Uh, and generally speaking, like, I, I think it's just interesting to imagine a world where STDs are not a thing. Like, what does the world look like if STDs are not a thing? <laughs> think about it. <laughs> So, challenging the status quo, it's something that I know we, we all like to imagine ourselves to be actively doing within this field. Uh, in crypto, it started with rejecting fiat. And I see in the Ethereum scene, one of the things that pulled me slowly out of Bitcoin is that the, it seems like the economic use case is the only thing most of my friends in Bitcoin care about. But I see in the Ethereum space, and I've seen at DevCon, like, ridiculously ambitious approaches to uh, rejecting nation state governance, to rejecting uh, traditional centralized management of resources, etc. In sex work, there is an imperative to reject the status quo because the status quo rejects us. Like we're not allowed, we're, we're allowed to exist on the margins, but we're afforded no protections and no sympathy when something happens to us. So censorship resistance is at the forefront for both of these communities. And particularly, again, the, the finance and economic use case is where we see like a foothold in for literally sex workers can be blocked immediately from all traditional banks in North America, from all legacy you know, payment processing, et cetera. So that's an area where even though it's kind of hard for end users to use some of the, the tools being built, they are so enthusiastic from within this community because there are no other choices, really. Yeah, and, and to be clear, like, Spank Chain is, you know, fully compliant with all the laws in all the countries in which we'll operate. Um, so, like, if somebody was advertising sex work on Spank Chain, like, we would have to remove their account because uh, that's going illegal, right? Uh, but 
you know, you can imagine that for decentralized payment services, right, then nobody has control. Uh, we couldn't, you know, have any impact on it if we wanted to. Uh, and further, like, if we do succeed at building decentralized communications infrastructure, then uh, that would also be possible. Um, so uh, th there's, a, there's also a case for decriminalization uh, of sex work. It is illegal in pretty much everywhere. Um, and in some places it is legal, but then it gets regulated. And so then the only people who can do it without getting heckled by the government are the people who get the licenses from the government. Uh, and then it's, it's sort of a boys club type thing anyway. Uh, and so uh, we, we've found that the, the criminalization of sex work means that sex workers are you know, less likely to, for example, call the police if there's an issue. Uh, because the police are less likely to side with them or might even imprison them or arrest them for doing sex work in the first place. Uh, and so this is a really unfortunate consequence of the, the criminalization. Uh, and so if, if we're able to succeed at reducing the stigma, then uh, you know, they'll have more of a voice and, and the ability to uh, like use the services, uh, as Chelsea was saying. Um, so, uh, how many people have, here have heard of FOSTA and SESTA? Okay, so FOSTA and SESTA, uh, FOSTA stands for Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act, and SESTA stands for uh, Stop Enabling Sex Traffickers Act. Uh, these passed in the House of Representatives and Senate earlier this year. Uh, I think in the Senate, it was like 97 to 2. Uh, in the House, it was like 400 and like 80 set 3 to, I don't know, like three or something like it's like literally the only thing that the Republicans and Democrats agree on that I've like at, at this scale it's kind of mind-boggling um, and, and it's partly because like it, it, while it, it says that it's fighting sex trafficking what it's actually doing uh, is uh, dismantling internet freedoms so sites uh, like Backpage, um, Reddit, uh, even um, they had sections uh, for personals uh, and what FOSTA and SESA does is it, it says that the websites are accountable for user-generated content, right? This has been a hallmark of uh, internet freedom for years, and by targeting sex workers, uh, they're able to make this uh, difficult enough to oppose, right? Because nobody, it's, it's really hard to stand up and be like, actually, you know, I, I want to oppose the, the sex trafficking uh, bill, right? <laughs> so. Uh, you've, you've, that's hard. <coughs> anyway, all right, cool. Uh, you want to do this? So I'll just say, uh, crypto is amazing for sex workers, and I like to compare like all of the early adopter performers on our platform are like Bitcoiners in 2013, 2014. Of like, they want to tell their mailman about this. They're so pumped. They want to tell everyone. But, I mean, there's still, uh, the Spank Chain platform is pretty easy to use. I was really surprised the first time I used it, how, uh, like, kind of the user interface just makes sense. You don't have to become a crypto expert. But in general, with moving crypto around, with getting it into fiat to pay your bills, etc., there's confusing UX and UI. Key management is a nightmare. Pretty much everything that the, the presentation before us was talking about, like, the, these are things that are going to be problems for end users. Um, and while performers have like an, you know, a complete drive to be on board with this, you know, you, we, we've got to get customers who can use legacy platforms and they're not going to get their banks shut down necessarily. We've got to get them on board. And one of the things I've seen a number of times, and this is why I kept my mouth shut about being a sex worker my entire time as a Bitcoin educator, is the assumptions that will be made of, oh, you're a sex worker and that means this about you. And so I think that's the main thing that, like, as a group, we can really do is make sure that we're not making assumptions about the capability of sex workers because all of the ones that I've met in my personal experience have been freaking brilliant. Um, and next slide, we've got, you know, like, like Brenna Sparks had the best quote on this that has been revisited a bunch from ETH Berlin. Blockchain offers freedom from a world that doesn't want me. Like, that hit me right in the heart, and it was like, 
I, you know, I did not come out of the closet. Everyone in my personal life, face to face, knew I was a sex worker, but I kept my mouth shut about it because I, I was so terrified that I would be just kind of discarded based upon this one element of what, you know, honestly, what was really a fiscally responsible decision throughout the period of time that I was able to make it. So, you know, like, we gotta walk the walk on inclusion. Inclusion shouldn't just be about quotas. It should be about taking each human being who comes into this community for who they are and not making assumptions about them. Um, and my, my last points on this are that I have seen sex workers have some skills and brilliances that we need. Particularly, we, we're always talking about incentive design. Like, holy crap, the sorts of creative campaigns that like cam girls will come up with. I remember seeing the like, oh, get all of my content for October if you send .0666 ETH. And it's all like, like spooky costumes and stuff like that. So there's that. And I find that the best understanding of consent comes from the sex work and the kink and fetish sorts of communities, because once we acknowledge the transactional nature of sexuality, we can have much more real and open conversations about it. Because this is a reality for everyone who gets subjectified, and it's much weirder to navigate when we pretend it doesn't happen. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's do some questions. We're going to maybe two or three questions. We're going to go there and there. Chelsea, are you going to dye your hair pink? They all did it right after I chemically dyed my hair dark blue, so it would <laughs> fall out. I feel so left out because they look super dope. <laughs> Hi, thanks for your presentation. Um, I learned recently that more than 50% of sex workers are victims of human trafficking. So I'm curious about your thoughts on the platform, and I think it sounds really great for sex workers who want to be sex workers, but most of them probably don't. Um, and so I'd be curious to hear your response to that. Yeah, this is, this is a really important piece to me, um, and it's why I'm out as a sex worker who is a voluntary participant who had choices. I feel that the only, I feel it's a really, really difficult problem to attack, especially because I experienced firsthand that there are sociopaths who specifically want a non-consent experience, and trafficking will never be will never be ended as long as that exists. However, my hope is that by reducing stigma overall, and by those of us who are voluntary participants in the industry speaking on behalf of others, like basically someone who has been trafficked and then feels that even if they've got a way out, they'll always be judged and it's assumed that, you know, like they're ruined or something, like that, that gives no ex path to exit for them. So I feel it's a really difficult problem and certainly one we can't solve right now, but I feel reducing stigma overall is the best thing I personally can contribute to that. And it is a huge priority for me. Uh, I'd also call into question the accuracy of that metric. Uh, I don't think it's 50%. I'd be curious to know where you got it. Um, it yeah, I, it, it might be geographical. Do you, do you know if that's like more centered in Canada? 50%, 5-0? in Canada, that's interesting to me. Um, so like, you know, if, if you look at like the seeking arrangements stats, uh, there's like 1.2 million students in the United States that are part of that. I doubt they're trafficked. I think they're just trying to pay off student loans. Um, but like, yeah, we can talk more after. Um, clearly nobody here is a fan of sex trafficking, right? Like that's not <laughs> what we're trying to accomplish. Um, we're we acknowledge that uh, sex trafficking makes this harder um, because the more that, you know, if we remove barriers to sex work, we might make the lives of sex traffickers easier, right? Uh, if we could accomplish this and make sex trafficking harder with, for example, more uh, emphasis on the identity uh, part of it, um, be, be needing to like ver verify yourself as you know consensual and uh, voluntary, then uh, we might be able to make headway. But uh, I'd have to think more about how to actually do that. Yeah, I mean, Shilsa, thank you very much. That's very, very great what you guys are doing and uh, eyes opening. 
Um, thank you for educating us. So my question is, what's the, the biggest challenge you have today? It's like, what's the things that if you could resolve or if it could change, will make everything much easier for you? Um, so I, I think part of this, uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of aspects of like, what is the biggest problem, right? So if we're talking about in the context of like, you know, embracing this movement, uh, then I think it's actually a numbers game. Like, I think the more people who have positive, uh, respectful interactions with sex workers as peers, um, and, and you know, performers as well, uh, then the, the more people will realize that, like, this is, you know, not this, like, crazy, dirty, terrible thing, uh, or, or it doesn't have to be. And so as that grows, and, 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 and the, the, you know, the, they're real people, Right, uh, and and as as that happens, I think that uh, everybody's minds will change. So the hardest thing about getting from here to there is like we all have to change our minds about it, right? If we if we have biases, if we have preconceptions, uh, and and it's pretty hard to change a bunch of people's minds, right? Uh, it like Bitcoin's been out for ten years now. Right, and like everybody here probably thought it was a joke or a scam the first time they saw it. Right. <laughs> and if I can just add, add also like bringing back around to the self sovereignty thing, I think the limitations of nation states trying to regulate in order to protect is actually the biggest barrier I see, and that's why I jumped on board. Super hype is because like like I come from Canada. And when they criminalized living off the avails of prostitution, they were trying to criminalize pimping, but they made it so that that extends to a landlord who knows that they're, they're, uh, you know, they're renting to a prostitute can go to jail. So it took all protective mechanisms out. People can't be security guards for prostitutes, et cetera. So I do feel the more we can have self-sovereign tools and platforms, and especially online platforms, where you can be your own boss, you can be pseudonymous, and you can make your own choices. I think that's the bi that's the biggest uh, thing we got to pursue. Yeah, and, and the regulations so far like haven't actually worked, right? Like the Fosta and Sesta they put more uh, prostitutes on the street, uh, and that's what's been reported by like police all over the country. Uh, and and they're you know end up targeting people for facilitating prostitution for like handing out condoms at like uh, clinics uh, to people who are known prostitutes, which doesn't make any sense. We're gonna do one final question. Let me see if there's anybody in the back that wants to just speak up. Okay. Thank you for the talk. I was wondering over, let's say over the next year, uh, how can we individually or as a community uh, help you guys and help Spank Chain if we're not if we're not either users or service providers on the platform? Um. I don't know. Good ideas. Well, I would say really the. I, I, I'm biased, but the, the cultural inclusivity part is, is huge for me because there are just kind of like, like immediate uh, snap judgments of like, oh, what's this? Is this replicating, you know, patriarchal objectification, et cetera? So I would say like, like welcoming in, we're, we, by onboarding all these performers, we're onboarding them to the crypto community. So they're going to be around, they're going to be chilling, they're going to be like dropping memes and stuff. So just be inclusive and recognize that like they're super brilliant, honestly, and like they need to be part of this and help us shape this. Yeah, be, be respectful. Don't make dead trucker jokes, stuff like that. Um, like when you talk about it, uh, you know, talk about it as if you would any other job. <laughs>